Good evening, everyone. My name is Steven. I am a developer, actually. I'm not a infrastructure guy. I guess today I do a lot more automation, so you could call me an automation engineer, or as the other Steve has a better word for it, but you, he will, I'm not going to steal it from him. And most importantly, I'm not a security expert. I don't actually have any sort of qualifications or certifications in security. I just, uh, you know, have a deep and keen in the stein, uh, interest in making sure that my, uh, you know, my work and what I do at a professional level uh, is something that I take pride in. So, <clears throat> last year and the beginning of this year, some pretty amazing things happened in the world of security. Every company listed here was involved in some way in a data breach, uh, either of your personal information or just in a huge mess up of some degree. Some of these names you might recognize, there's a guy in the corner there, Equifax has probably got the most uh, like news uh, coverage, but all of these guys have done something in the last year, or been involved in the news in the last year for not protecting data and not keeping your secrets secure. And this is, I mean, sure, all of these companies are pretty much uh, international, American, all that sort of stuff, but it, it happened here as well. We've had two major data breaches in the last year. The first data breach happened with the Bonds database, which means uh, over a million South Africans, maybe more, I can't remember the exact number, all of your personal details, your ID numbers, your addresses, your all sorts of stuff just got leaked out into the internet. And then a couple of weeks ago, uh, Viewfinds, they did the same thing, basically. They were keeping backups on a server which had no security on it, and Hackers just downloaded the database, and look at that. Your usernames are in there, your emails, your passwords in plain text. So all of these things are problems that we don't want to be involved in. You don't want to be the guy who comes in in the morning and finds out, oh my gosh, all of our secrets have been exposed outside there. And uh, you know, in today's modern DevOps world, particularly with um, Docker and stuff like that, you have to be a little bit more aware of how to keep those secrets, how to share those secrets as well. So... <clears throat> I got security audited. I work in a team. We, have, we keep a lot of customer data. So some guys rocked up at the desk. They gave us a, a couple of weeks, and they said, look, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to check and see your systems. We're going to see how it looks, and we're going to make sure that you guys are not leaking anything. We're not giving away secrets. You know, everything is good and fine. They treat us like that guy over there. You know, security looks at us like we're the enemy. And it's actually quite strange because we're actually trying to help them at the end of the day. They came back and they gave us a whole set of reports. I cannot kid you, it probably was about 100 and something pages. It's like, here are all the problems in your systems. We went through some of these problems. Some of them, I think, were legit, but probably 99% of them were just their process, right? They're just saying, oh, well, you're not allowed to do this because we decided. I mean, they even audit our dev environment. Like... There's no sensitive information on dev, but there they are saying, hey, you're leaking secrets on dev. You're using standard usernames and passwords. It's like, okay, if you say so. So you know, we, we sort of get told, like, okay, do something better, right? So I sat there and I said, okay, well, how can I keep secrets, particularly since their audit was not designed around containerization, first of all, or orchestration. They literally say, can you log onto the machine? I'm like, well, I, I don't really, I can't really log onto a Docker container. It's not really how it works. So they don't even audit like the base machines where the containers are running. They just audit your actual application. So anyway, it's a little bit silly. And I thought, okay, well, I don't want to be this guy getting this ream of paper again. So what can I do about that? And I said, okay, cool. I'm going to fix our secrets. That's step one. So I want to make sure that any secrets are keeping in the system. I have full control over it. And I know exactly what's happening with it. And these are the sort of systems that it's going to apply to. I want to make sure the Git is okay. I want to make sure Docker is okay. Whatever application settings are in there, environment variables. So that was where we started. It got more complicated because I then had to go back and find out what actually are secrets because my assumption was not true. So when we talk about secrets in automation world, this is pretty much the list. Your certificates, your keys are generally considered secrets. Your usernames and your passwords are generally considered secrets. All that other stuff, nobody really cares. So when we had to go through this, we were like, okay, cool. So our certificates, are they secure? Do only the right people have access to them? And do the machines have access to them? 
And we will come back just now why wow, the right people is really weird in Docker. So how did we do this before? Well, you know, we had a guy. We had some guy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, dude, we deployed to production. This is the new username and password. He wandered on somewhere, found a terminal, and typed something in, and da da, it was working. And it was amazing. Except, uh, you know, obviously, it wasn't really automated, unless you consider that, you know, you went to push him. Um, and all the secrets were only available on that machine. So, oh, and ideally, that was the world it was supposed to be. All right, so that's okay. Then we come to Docker. So there's some major changes that come into this. Number one, that guy doesn't know where these containers are, depending on the uh, orchestration infrastructure you're running. Um, <clears throat> there's no obvious host machine. And if you're keeping your secrets on the host machine, which containers have access to those secrets? And <clears throat> you don't want to, like, have your secrets available to any container. So, you know, and doing it manually is really hard. Containers don't have persistence in the way that, like, a host machine would. So if you put a certificate in there, you've got to make sure that it exists for any instance of the container, but it's not necessarily part of the container. Because, you know, you can go ask IBM about that. They have an amazing story where they put their certificates in their Docker image, and they sent that out into the wild. And luckily, there were nice people out there who said, hey, you know that your private keys are in your image? And they were like, well, we better change that. But, you know, you don't want to be that situation as well. So you've got to know which level is the secret and how to abstract your secrets out of your applications, particularly your Docker environments. So with that all said, these are the sort of things we want to look for in, in, when you want to manage secrets, right? You want to make sure that your interfaces are limited. So only the things that need the secret have access to the secret. If you are now having to give secrets to the host machine so that Docker containers can also use it, it's probably in the wrong direction. Uh, you want to be able to easily rotate your, your secrets. Don't assume that the thing about secrets is not about if they get cracked, it's when they will be cracked. It doesn't matter how fancy you're going to get. There's a million bored script kiddies out there who are going to try every combination to try and get into your machine, and they, they really they just outnumber you. So just assume it's going to be broken, and instead of keeping one set of secrets, make sure that you can rotate your secrets around, you know, change your passwords. As much as we all love that thing where you get your passwords expired every 30 days, in the automation world, it actually makes more sense because, you know, it's not a person. You can rotate the secret. You should be able to rotate your secrets as easy as you want. Uh, leasing is also a pretty cool thing. So when you do want to give somebody access to a, an environment, but you don't want them to be always uh, able to access an environment, you can lease them. You can say, okay, here's your, here's your access. It will last 30 minutes. In our world, like as actual developers and stuff, that's pretty important because I don't know how many times you guys got woken up in the morning saying, hey, something's broken on the server. And you're like, okay, I'll call you in the morning when I get in the office because there's nothing I can do now. So you want to be able to say, okay, well, this guy needs temporary access in a production environment. How can I make sure that he gets that without necessarily compromising security all the time? Auditing is obvious, you know who's been doing what, when they've been doing that. Makes it much easier when you know, something does go wrong. Uh, obviously, we want to be automation. Everything must be automated. We don't want to necessarily have to you know, manually log on to some host machine and hope for the best, particularly if you don't know where your containers are going to end up running. And the last thing is federated. So your containers is much better if they can ask for secrets instead of trying to embed your secrets with your application. In order for this to be federated, you need to be able to say, okay, well, this set of container types, which have application A, are allowed to talk and get secrets under this category. So uh, guys like AWS, so Amazon does this very well. They have a whole federation secrets engine, and you actually register your containers with their secret keepers, and they send you back information. It's very, very cool. If you guys ever want to see an amazing example of what that means, like go look at the AWS stuff. All right, so let's talk about some of the tools that I, I then went through. Because I thought, well, let me start with the simple, guys. How can I deal with secrets in Git, right? Because one of the line items on the thing was, like, your secrets are in your source code, which I think is what every developer does. They're just like, it's a password. It doesn't matter. That can go there. So we initially started with Git crypt just to make sure that whatever we're storing in our uh, Git repo is not exposing things that shouldn't be exposed. Um, so Git Crypt is a tool. It's okay. I use it a lot these days, but I'm not really fond of it because of 
It's not really an automation tool. Uh, it doesn't really support any of the things that we just said there. It doesn't really have limited interfaces. I have no way of telling the difference between file one and file two. There's, you can only encrypt at a file level. You can't encrypt it like a, like a particular username or password, which makes it very awkward. So if you've got like a JSON files, for example, with your configuration in it, GitCrypt will be like, I'm going to encrypt every JSON file. You can be more specific and like narrow it down, but it's not, it's not ideal. It's not exactly what we want for a Dockerized world. It's very nice if you're just a source code guy, you know, I want to give that guy control or access to the secrets in the repo. It's really crap in the container because you kind of end up with a situation where how does the container get the, the authority to read? And also, I think if any one of you is deploying containers or building containers that pull from Git, you're probably not really always going in the right direction either. You know, maybe you should pre-compile or use a build container or something else to don't necessarily like check out your source code into an image and then send it out into the World Wide Web. Unless you're on Node, in which case we don't care anymore, right? Um, also, I guess, just a little bit of a side note about GitCrypt. It also goes against what Git is about, right? Git is about, federate, or about sharing your source code. When you get GitCrypt, you're going to look at your source code and you're just going to see garbage, like mangled, encrypted stuff. That's not really going to help you share your source code with anybody. Um, and if you want to do a PR on something like that, well, you're going to have a hard time. Hey, there's differences in these two files. And you're like, OK, except, I guess. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so then I moved on to something else. Another tool that we have in our, our stable of tools is Ansible. And Ansible Vault is built in with it. And it's also designed as this secret keeping system. Um, in my experience, the way Ansible works uh, is not really very much in a Docker, Docker world. But I guess you could use Ansible Vault if you deploy your containers from Ansible. In which case, you kind of got the same problems that GitCrypt has. Ansible will like, kind of lock down that uh, encryption per repo. And the only kind of difference is that you can see here, you can encrypt at a string level. So I could say just encrypt the password and you end up with this nice big hashy thing here. Um, otherwise, you can also just do the files if you want to do it that way. Um, it's nice because obviously Ansible knows how to decode this. So once you've got it going, you don't really need to care anymore. You can just kind of say, you know, Ansible, this play, and it will carry on with its life. It's not nice if you want to share these secrets in any sort of way, or if you're working with a more orchestrated type environment like Kubernetes or Swarm or something like that. Then it gets a little bit more awkward. Um, then I have another tool that I use on a regular basis called Chef. Chef comes in with something called Chef Vault. Unlike Ansible Vault, Chef Vault is not really stored in your source at all, right? Ansible, you, you create these configs, you build them into your configuration file, and you, you, know, you check it up in your repos and stuff like this. With Chef Vault, that doesn't really exist. You store your secrets on Chef Vault, which is normally associated with the Chef server. They use this encrypted data bag technology. Um, it's obviously, if you're using Chef Vault, it's really nice if you use it with the Chef cookbooks. But outside of that, uh, well, if you don't use Chef, you're not going to get any value out of this. It's not obvious how you like, tie Docker into something like Chef Vault, at least not to me, unless you're using Chef to deploy your Docker containers. But I don't know if that's, uh, you know, I've tried it. it. It's workable, but it's not fun. So then we're going to get onto something as a real Vault, right? So up until now, we've talked about things that were almost there. And this is, in my experience, in that sort of same vein world, before you talk about real orchestration tools and stuff like that, this to me feels like an amazing tool. It works really well. <laughs> uh, it's a secret. <laughs> so uh, Hashicorp Vault, unlike the other guys, he's very he he's really okay. First of all, let me let me start at the beginning. HashiCorp Vault is an external tool from everything else. So Ansible is bundled with Ansible, Chef is bundled with Chef, and uh, GitCrypt will obviously be kind of bundled to your source control. Whereas HashiCorp Vault will run wherever, however you want to run it, and it's completely, it, it's completely uh, dissociated from your actual applications, which is a good and a bad thing. It's amazing because that means that, you know, like Marcus said, if anyone is running it, you can just piggyback off them. But it's also not so amazing if, you, if you've got a legacy system that has no idea how to work with, hash, with the vaults. Um, this does all the things, sorry, like things like Ansible Vault and Chef, oh, well, Ansible Vault doesn't really have key rotation and what they call key rolling. There's no 
easy audit logs that come out of Ansible or Git, Git Crypt or even Chef Vault, unless you have access to the Chef servers. Um, and it, they have this whole thing, what they call uh, secret engines, right? So with HashiCorp Bolt, you'll say, hey, my secret engine is AWS, or my secret engine is key value pairs. And it will know how to integrate with those type of products. So if you, if you deploy all your stuff in the cloud and you want to use something like HashiCorp Vault, it's amazing. It works really, really well. It's very secure. They've made sure that nothing gets exposed that shouldn't be exposed. Uh, the only thing about it is it's not version 1. So if you work in a corporate that cares about that stuff, you might have a hard upward battle. And um, it's also, uh, you know, I, I would personally recommend it. If you're not worried about your containers so much and you just want an awesome vault, this is the guy to go for. Of course, we are talking about containers, so we don't just need to worry about those sort of things. There are also tools that are built into our favorite containerization tools and uh, orchestration tools. So Docker Swarm has a whole set of secrets, which is good, but very opinionated. So obviously, if you run Docker Swarm, you'd, you can just tell Docker Swarm, you'll see a command like that, like you say, hey, Docker secret create with something. And what it does is it creates a volume or an in-memory file that goes associated with your container. This is very nice, but it means that all your secrets have to be considered files, which is uh, if you use environment variables or anything like that, you, it's not going to work. You're going to have to go reconfigure your container, you reconfigure your images to load secrets from files. So if you go look at uh, the MySQL image on uh, Docker Hub, you'll see they've started to integrate this stuff. So there are guys out there who are doing that work for you, but you also, if you roll your own containers, you're going to have to worry about it for yourself. Uh, obviously, you're going to need version 113 and higher for it. So if you are running on CentOS, older versions of CentOS and RHEL, you're going to have a bad time. Or just don't worry about it, you know, because Swarm doesn't really work on those versions anyway. So, um, and in my experience, I don't see a lot of guys using Docker Swarm. But to be fair, I don't see a lot of guys using Docker either. So maybe it's just, the, you know, it's the, you know, causality rather than like actual problems here. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good tool. I would recommend if you're running on Docker Swarm, there's no reason why you can't use the secrets. It's just completely built in. It's as simple as this. You just got two commands and secrets are, are in your containers. It doesn't matter where your containers are running. The other tools you have to worry, okay, where is the containers running and how. Here it's like, hey, any, any container that I call Redis, I can give it the secret. And it's not even that stupid because like, I can't just create like a, hey, this is my sneaky container called Redis. It will actually go and make sure that that service name actually contains the right thing. So you can't just like, accidentally like, leak your secrets to other guys who are running on the swarm. It's very much uh, associated directly with the things that you need to give it to. And it's even cool because if you rotate it, it'll be like, I'll just go automatically update all your containers with the new secrets. And if you try to remove your secret, it'll say, whoa, whoa, <laughs> all of these containers are currently using that secret. So it's nicely integrated into the system, but it's, uh, you know, mileage will vary if you actually get any sort of Docker, Docker Swarm exposure. And the last guy is Kubernetes. Uh, we recently went on a big Kubernetes journey. I think we've done really well. Uh, I think Kubernetes secrets are amazing. They do have some little fine print somewhere that says be careful because they store it on the host machine in plain text. But, you know, we don't care about that anymore. We don't actually do that. So they encrypt it on ours. Oh, really? Cool. Never mind then. So there was, a, there was a problem once upon a time where Kubernetes was storing the secrets that it was associated. It still does by default. You have to turn it off. Okay. So if you run your own Kubernetes cluster, remember that. If you don't run your own cluster, just ask that question and, you know, see if the system engineer even understands what you're talking about. So for Kubernetes secrets, you really, um, you, the Docker, Docker Swarm guys will always assume it has to be a file. Kubernetes is not as opinionated. They give you the option to use secrets from any source and use secrets in any way. So if you want to provide your username and passwords and your uh, certificates and all that sort of stuff as part of your environment variables, you can do that with Kubernetes. You can't do that with Docker Swarm at all. Um, obviously, Automation and all that sort of stuff is really, really easy. It just runs on the Kubernetes cluster. You don't even have to uh, really worry about it. Uh, you can accidentally expose secrets <laughs> in Kubernetes. You know, any container that runs in a namespace technically has access to the same secrets. So you just got to be a bit careful about how your namespaces are set up. Um, 
And you can also, you can volume mount directly into your container. So you can say, hey, mount my security key as a key in, as a key in the container. Or if you want to, you can say, Here's a, here it is as a secret. So you'll see the two the simple commands on the side there. You just create a couple of files. You tell Kubernetes to create the secrets from those files. And then when you create your pod and stuff like that, you can just tell it where you create a secret volume on your pod. And you say, this is the pod. And this is the name. This is my secret, which is we'll get from the other side over there. And then that's it. It'll have access to the secrets. And it will never actually be visible unless you do something silly like you know, echo out your password or something weird like that. But hopefully we don't do that, right? Cool. Um, sure, that was pretty much my, my journey and my experience with it. And just a quick overview of the tools we have. Uh, if there's anybody who has any uh, burning questions, everyone's happy? No. <laughs> cool. You, you can, yeah, because what you do then is that you store your secrets in the vault, and when you generate your configuration for Kubernetes, you tell it to go to vault, uh, to, the answer, uh, to whatever vault. That's kind of how we do it, right? Uh, it works fine, but it would, then obviously what you've got to worry about then is that there's a weird sort of like leakage that could happen, because I could say my vault is very well protected, and I know exactly who has audit rights today, right? But then my Kubernetes cluster is run completely somewhere else. I don't know who has audit rights on that. So if I tell the Kubernetes, or if I tell the Kubernetes deployments to use the vault, sure, I will know Kubernetes got the secrets. But then after that, I don't know. And if I rotate the secrets in the vault, Kubernetes, I have to actively tell it, hey, listen, the secrets are different now. Whereas Kubernetes already got a built-in system for rotating. So they won't synchronize back and forth. So you have to pick one guy and say, you are in charge, and everyone else must just respect you. No. <laughs> no, no, no. They don't have that much time on their head. They have got a lot of teams to go through before. But uh, there is, I think they do a post audit at some point. So hopefully when they come back around, we all look good. But yeah, not yet. Cool. Awesome. Thanks a lot, guys.